Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. Tonight is sort of an impartation service. Praise God. And um, I'll explain why so, because many times, um, There are things that come, and they're meant only by nature to impart some spiritual thing. The Bible says, I come to you that I might impart unto you some spiritual thing, that in the end you will be established. Somebody shout hallelujah. Establishment comes through such days, such impartations. Because... With the words that are shared tonight, understanding comes. And all of us know that where understanding is, establishment is. Somebody shout hallelujah. But when the Bible says that I might implant to you some spiritual gift, right? Pneumaticos, right? Some spiritual gift, charismatos, the, the source of the miraculous, the faculty of the miraculous. It means that there is something that God wants to put in you for your tonight that something out of you that very thing once it starts to come out of you to produce miracles somebody shout hallelujah it will produce miracles and it's possible for God to do it through impartation and words spoken as such hallelujah and that's my prayer to God tonight that as you hear these words that you're going to listen to that a great impartation is going to happen in your life and that many things are going to be defined in your spirit both as a believer and as a minister of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Because I believe all of us who are called to be ministers of the gospel, regardless of where you are and what you're doing, the end of it is that God will use you in this world. You don't need to be on the pulpit like Grace Lubega. But wherever the Lord has blessed you, you will do mighty exploits. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, to begin with, I would need to introduce us to... An idea in mind in Second Kings. Now, if you have read the Bible, you will realize that there are two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, and they are found in the book of Kings. They don't have their own separate book, like Isaiah or Jeremiah. And of course, many people ask themselves, why is it that Elijah and Elisha do not have books written separately like the rest of the prophets because of not only what they were teaching the church or what God intended to teach through them uh, to us now and them that existed then but fully to the church now present but also the kind of anointing that functioned on these two prophets Elijah had a special grace on his life Elisha received a special grace on his life. And as I share tonight, you will not only appreciate but come to the full understanding of why God had to put these two prophets in the kingly anointing. Praise God. It's because of the influence they had in the spirit realm. It's the power that God gave them in the spirit realm and consequently the purpose that was ordained on their lives. Now, we all know the story of Elijah, the son of Nimshi. He encounters God and he becomes a prophet. In the time when Israel is so deluded in the things of the spirit and disconnecting from God in the existent time of Ahab and his crazy wife. The scriptures tell us 
that we start to see war, if you may say, between darkness and light, between the spirit of the prophet and the anointing on Elijah and Israel that then had formed the foundation of demonic worship, of course, through Jezebel. And we see Ahab's heart turning every day away from God because of his wife, who had not only given into Satan, Lucifer, but also had built herself monuments and had raised herself prophets of Baal. Praise God. And so at one particular point we see the prophet Elijah throwing a challenge on Baal and he defeats. And the scriptures tell us that Jezebel said, I'm going to kill this man. And so the scriptures tell us he flees, if you remember. And when he enters a cave, you all know the story, God comes to him and tells him, what are you doing here? He tells him, you know, all your prophets in Israel have been killed, only I remain and there is none that is there except me, da 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 da. And then God tells him, uh uh, Elijah, I have kept for me 7,000 prophets in Israel that are hid, yes, and have not bowed their heads to bow. What many of us don't realize is this 7,000 hidden in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal were hidden deliberately by God. They were preserved by God. But what many of us don't know is even though Elijah was a prophet, the 7,000 were hid from his realm of vision. They were hid from his optical experience in the prophetic. And you see, Sometimes, when people walk in the office of the prophet, and I've seen this many times because I function so much in the prophetic, so I'm acquainted with that realm. There is a deception in certain people that because you have access to the spirit realm, therefore you have access to everything in the spirit realm. Are you hearing me? Or at least we deceive men or we lead men to believe that we have access to everything in the spirit realm. That is not how so the word of God teaches. God gives access according to your level of understanding. There are many other aspects that provoke the spirit of the prophet either to access or not to access. Even your spirit, the human spirit, can lock out a prophet. Even if he wants to see, your human spirit can lock out a prophet. Your level of faith can lock out the prophetic. Depending on whether it's negative or even positive. If I can give you the experience of the Shunammite woman, the scriptures tell us that when she comes and falls before the prophet, who was that, Elisha? The Bible says, He says, let her alone, for the Lord has not revealed to me what is troubling her soul. Even the prophet did not have access to know that this woman's child had died. Why? Because in her spirit, she had refused to believe that her child was dead. Now, if Elisha, at that particular point, saw by the spirit that this woman's child had died, then he would not be seeing by the Spirit of God. He would be seeing by a familiar spirit. Did you hear what I just said? He said, let her alone for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord has hid it from me and has not told me. There's a reason why God could not tell Elisha the predicament of this woman. Why? Because her spirit, her soul, had not admitted that her child had died. Do you understand? Even if you have cancer in your body and the doctor says you have cancer and you have refused to believe that you have cancer, a prophet can't see what you have refused to accept. That's a familiar spirit. I know some of you understand what I'm saying. Why? Because this was not something admitted in her spirit. So the spirit realm could not confirm. It could not confirm what was not affirmed in the spirit. Yes, her child was dead, but she had not 
confirmed it in her spirit. So the spirit realm would not represent this child as dead. So, because the prophet did not see that, that means he's not a man of God. It only means that that particular point, her spirit could not give access, the Lord would not grant access to know what was vexing this woman's soul because she had not admitted it in her heart. In fact, when the kid dies, the husband asks, is everything well with you? She says, yes, all is well. When she meets the servant of the prophet and asks, and a prophet of the prophet asks her, is all well? She tells him, all is well. So, how then would God say it is not? Did you understand what I just said? So that's one experience. But there's also another experience where we, a man or woman of God, may not see fully, comprehend fully the things of the Spirit. And sometimes it is because of the level of that man's understanding. Elijah was a prophet. 100% a prophet, a man of God. His voice print was very defined in the spirit realm. His frequency was straight. I mean, he called fire from heaven and it appeared. But you see, 7,000 men were hid from Elijah. And many people don't know why 7,000 men were hid from Elijah. I'll tell you why. The reason why 7,000 men are hid from Elijah, it is because Elijah had not had the full understanding of his place and assignment in the prophetic. Even though he was a prophet of God, he had not received the defined full understanding of the prophetic assignment on his life. Otherwise, God would not ask him, what are you doing here? This was a man who was scared running for dear life because he thought that he was going to be killed. He did not have understanding of the purpose of God concerning his life fully. He had not yet fully apprehended. In fact, when the Lord tells him that I have 7,000 for me who have not bowed their knees to bow, right? God cast a vision on Elijah. And he entered a certain level of understanding in God. That is why the scriptures tell us the moment after that encounter, he finds Elisha and he can perceive that Elisha is among the hidden. Did you understand what I just said? He can perceive by the Spirit that Elisha is among them which are what? Hidden. And the Bible says he casts his mantle on him. On Elisha he says, oh, the son of Shaphat, can I go and say bye to my parents? By the way, that son of Shaphat, Shaphat was a very rich man. He wasn't poor. So Elisha was not coming from a poor family. No. He tells him, no, you know not what has been done to you. You don't understand what has been done to you. What happens? Elisha gets the vision of what this man is saying. Kills the animals and before we know it, he starts to follow the man of God and pour water in his hands and serve him. We all know the story. But of the 7,000 hidden, Elisha minus, that's 6,999 prophets that existed in Israel without knowledge of their true assignment as voices in that nation. And many died hid. History was never kind enough to tell us their stories. Or even give us details about who exactly they were and for who they served and how they served. Later on we start reading scriptures such as there were sons of prophets. Are you hearing me? Because there's a way the prophetic can be inspired into your children. It's possible in a way. So these guys are hid, and I always tell people that there is no glory in being hid when you're away from assignment and purpose. No, it's the generation I've seen that laughs at men who Jezebel is chasing because they're so hidden to function anywhere to attract the attention of Jezebel. And so they laugh, oh, Jezebel is after that fellow. Jezebel is after that woman. But maybe for you, you're so hid that... You don't have any effect in the spirit enough to catch Jezebel's attention. But when you tell people that, oh, the 7,000 that are his, they stand up and say, Father, hide me. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. 
But that's not how so we've learned Christ. Tell your neighbor, Amen. God has not raised you up to be heat. The Bible is very clear. No man lights a candle and puts it under a what? A bushel. For every hidden thing, the Bible says, shall be brought to manifestation. Consequently, God has to pull you under that bushel and put you up to give light to the world. He says, for as long as I'm in this world, I am the light of the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. You are not anointed to be healed. Somebody shout hallelujah. You are not anointed to be healed. You are not raised to be healed. God didn't put that anointing on your life to be healed. God gave you something because he knew that that thing would come out and the world will see it and say, truly there is a God that abides in men. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so, Elisha starts to serve and follow his master. Now, the Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9, the Bible says, if you remember, I'll need to probably give you a picture. Elijah is about to go. God is about to take him up in a whirlwind, right? And then the spirit realm was so open to every prophet to discern that this man was being taken out. People felt it. Praise God. So he's come from Gilead. He's walking with Elisha. In the hand he tells him, you know what? Carry here. The Lord has sent me to what? To Bethel. Elisha tells him, for as long as the Lord liveth and your soul is within you, I will never leave you. They go to Bethel. Next time they reach Bethel, he tells him, you know what? Carry here. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. The scriptures tell us, Elisha again tells him, for as long as the Lord liveth and your soul is is still alive, I will never leave you. And he tells him, okay, even in Jericho, he tells him, tarry here, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And you realize that from the first onset of denying Elisha to go with Elijah, the prophets are always there telling him, knowest thou that the Lord is taking your master? Do you know that the Lord is taking your master? Have you knowledge that the Lord is taking your master? And he's telling them, I know. What many of us don't see is that when the Lord was taking Elisha, the whole prophetic realm got to know. But many of them did not ask themselves the question, why is it that God has told all of us? Why has he told every prophet in the land that there is one guy going? Because there is something on Elijah that the prophetic world does not understand. Many of the 6,999 look at Elijah as the master of Elisha. They don't see more than that. They don't see more than that. God is generous enough to tell them, look, I'm casting a vision for you to see that this man is going to go. If many of the prophets in that time have the understanding that I'm going to share with you tonight, all of them would have followed him. When he goes to Jericho, they'll go with him. If he went to Jordan, they'll go with him. If he went to to Bethel, they will go with him. But they did not have the understanding that the man that was walking the surface of that earth that God was about to take up was not only a prophet, but he was the chariot and the horseman of Israel. Now, the scriptures tell us very clearly in the ninth verse, and it came to pass that when they were gone over, Elijah asked, said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now I know that that is where the church has gotten the idea of God, I need a double blessing. Everything is double, double. They're saying double. But many of us don't have the understanding of what a double portion is. Deuteronomy 21 verses 15. He gives a picture of two wives. He says, if a man has two wives, one is beloved, another is hated, and they have born him children, both beloved and they hated. And if the firstborn son was hers who was hated, this is a loved woman, this is a hated woman, but they are both his wives, but the firstborn was of the hated woman. The next verse says, Then shall it be that he maketh his sons, when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he has, he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. He says, if there are two women, he loves one beloved, one he hates, and both of them have children, but the hated one has a child first. Even if the beloved has a first child, 
God tells this man he should not make the son of the beloved firstborn. Why? Because the first, the, the, the hated woman had a child first indeed. And the next verse says in 17, but he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him what? A double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength and the right of his firstborn is his. Now, Elijah following Elisha does not mean that Elisha was the only servant of Elijah. If we are discussing double portion, Elisha must be able to concede in his spirit that I am not the only man serving this man. There's probably others. They are not given names. They don't carry identities, but I'm sure he's not walking alone. He's telling him, give me a double portion. In other words, make me firstborn. Did you understand what I just said? Now, that only can be understood when we study the law of inheritance. Because inheritance has a principle. That is why the church of Jesus Christ, every time it disconnects from the father-son relationship, and many people are fatherless in the church. Many people prefer to have teachers, rabbis, mentors, and not fathers and mothers in the spirit. For though you have 10,000 instructors in the Lord, but a few fathers, for through Christ I have begotten you. Every time that order is destroyed, something in the spirit realm starts to frustrate the law of inheritance. And that is why now we see churches of men of God who die, or before they die, they hand over responsibility to their own sons. Yes, some increase in money. Yes, some increase in numbers but they don't increase in the glory and the anointing they can't open blind eyes they can't open deaf ears they can't cut out tumors but they are growing and they think that growth is a validation of the spirit listen the true vindication of the spirit is the power of god that follows the message somebody receive it and now we live in a dispensation where it is strange to demonstrate power in certain churches because they're so scared about what power will do. They're not used to the anointing. They're used to human orders and ways of men. They have established human imposed traditions, things that are of all carnal kind of nature, and they are called religious piety. They have a certain order, but they're dying with cancers. They are seated strong, quiet, but their kids are dying with drugs. We refuse that in our generation. God must put something enough on you to look straight in the eyes of your son and tell him in the name of Jesus Christ, you will not put your lips again on weed. And the power of God goes through him and he stands up preaching with you on the streets. Somebody shout hallelujah. For my speech was not in the plausible words of men, but as it was in the demonstration of the power of God. He says it was the proof of his glory operating on me. And he says, and it stirred in my ears the most holy emotions. And that's persuading them that your faith should not dwell in, in the wisdoms of men, but as it is in the power of God. He's not only Christ the wisdom, but he is Christ the power and the wisdom of God. You can't claim to be born again and there is no power in your life. I'll rather what functions on you scares men. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let God do something in your life. Let God put something on your spirit that men will observe it and fear. The Bible says that God moved with Moses and men were afraid. The Bible says the anointing of God settled on Moses. And men were afraid because of the glory of God. And that's your portion in Christ. May what is upon you scare men. May what is upon you set nations. May what is upon you make men lose peace and sleep and appetite. Why? Because you have God. Now Elijah, why he is a man found in the book of Kings was because Elijah was no average prophet. He did not come only with a message like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. No. He came to establish a certain order of the spirit. And that is why 
When this man tells him, give me a double portion of your spirit, he tells him, you have asked for a thing that is so hard. It's hard. What you're asking for is hard, he tells him. Why? Because Elisha is asking for responsibility. He's not just asking for power. He's asking for responsibility. But he tells him, but if you see me go, if you see the Lord take me, the Bible tells him, it shall be so to you. But if you don't see me go, it shall not be so to you. In fact, when you study the literal Hebrew, the word there translated, if it be so, if you see me carried, right? It says, when you see me taken from thee, right? The literal Hebrew translation there is, if you see the way I see in the end of my purpose. Did you hear that? If you see the way I see at the end of my purpose. In other words, if God gets your eyes, my eyes of the Spirit, or gets your eyes of the Spirit, Elisha, and then your eyes of the Spirit come to see the way I see God in the responsibility of purpose toward my end, Firstly, you will recognize that you are a continuation of a bigger purpose on the face of the earth than simply sending one message. What Elijah and Elisha came to do was establishing a definitive order in the graces of the anointing. They were not just men with a message. And I'm going to give you that understanding tonight. They were not just men with a message. They carried a distinctive... When the Lord showed me this, I was like, oh my God. Now I understand why the church is becoming more and more powerless why christians are becoming more and more powerless why sin easily comes into our doors and we tolerate it god help our dispensation something has to be seen and heard and felt that it will that a man will just come in the anointing and repent without rebuking him over anything but not be comfortable in the anointing Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, Elisha was first born to Elijah. Not because he cast on him the mantle first, but because he came first in the heart of the man. Who has understood what I just said? Because some anointings don't come through going on the mountain. Some anointings don't come through just praying. They come through impartations from men who God has put something onto. They didn't buy it. Many of them probably did not even, they didn't earn it. But God gave them a distinction in their generation. Elijah, Elisha, is a typical example that it does not matter how many prophets were in Israel. There was something that was supposed and would sit on Elisha later that no other prophet was going to carry. And consequently, the preservation of the gospel. That is why when he tells them, if you see as I see toward the end of my purpose, in the fulfillment of my purpose, the literal, you realize he's trying to tell him I'm not just an average prophet. I'm not just your master. I am the chariot and horseman of Israel. It has to become a revelation. The scriptures are clear. The moment Elijah is carried up, do you know why he tells him, if you don't see me, you will not receive it? Because there was a vision that God was supposed to cast on Elisha when Elisha was going up. If Elisha was not there to see that vision, it was not enough to lay hands on him. He had to see that vision. God had to show him. So when the whirlwind comes through and is carried, are you hearing me? A chariot of fire and the horses of fire. He says, oh, my father, he says, my father, the horseman and chariot of Israel. The horseman and the chariot of Israel, they're old. It means to say, when Elisha sees the vision of how the horses were looking like and the chariot, he gets an impression in his spirit that this was not an average prophet. 
you're asking for the anointing of the firstborn and that would be okay if the double portion was asked from a simple prophetic messenger the double anointing you're asking for elisha is a man establishing another order in the spirit this is more than just go tell israel this is more than just go speak to the Ammonites. This is more than just God tell them that the hand of Zerubbabel that has started this work itself, finish it for it's not by power, not by might, but by the spirit. Uh, Haggai or, or Zechariah. No. They did their part, bless God for that. But Elijah is setting a certain order in the spirit. If I simply Zechariah and you ask for a double anointing, it was simple as laying hands on you, but you're asking for something so hard because God is going to call you to the responsibility of being the horseman and chariot of Israel. But none of these prophets knew. They only looked at Elijah as the servant of Elisha as the servant of Elijah. Here he is asking him, knowest thou that the Lord is taking away your master? Knowest thou that the Lord is taking away your master? In fact, if you go back through the scripture, the Bible says, it came to pass that a uh, verses 11, and it came to pass that they still went on, right? That behold, there appeared a chariot of fire. Where was that? In Jordan, right? They were in Jordan. And the Bible says, and, and there appeared a chariot of fire and the horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Remember in the first place, the first impression of the spirit was God is going to take him through a whirlwind. These other prophets don't pick any other detail. They don't see the, the horses. They don't see the chariots of fire. They just see the end of the whirlwind. These are two different experiences happening at the same moment. But God chose those who see him simply as a prophet to see the whirlwind. And the one who must see him with the responsibility to carry the purpose, to see the horseman, the chariot, he's telling them I'm going. But you see, there are details to this issue. What the simple prophet will see is a whirlwind. But if you see me go, you'll pick deeper responsibility, deeper understanding of my part in this lot. Now he tells him, the Bible says, verses 12, and Elisha, saw it and he cried my father he saw it he got the vision finally that the man he was serving was not just an average prophet yes from day one he has been serving because he was impressed by god to serve the man of god but he had never had the full apprehension of who elijah was that was the day he saw it to tell him look now that you're asking for the double portion if you see this you'll understand that it's, it's givable to you if you don't it you don't need it why because you're going to receive an anointing but without the understanding of its purpose my responsibility as a prophet elijah he said is over the nation of israel not only just as a prophet but i'm, I'm a father i'm the horseman and chariot thereof in fact elijah passes in the class of the master prophet he was supposed to carry mastery over the whole prophetic realm of Israel. But Israel never knew it. Why? Because there's also like another fellow there who sees in the spirit. He sees the wild wind and says, our entire prophet too. But where do you see from? At what level do you see from? Now, when the Bible says, and Elisha saw it, he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the husband thereof, and he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and rent them in two pieces. And the Bible says he took upon the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of what? Jordan. By the bank of Jordan. Wherever there is a bank, there is a river, isn't it? And the Bible says, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He's putting a demand on the operation of the anointing he has understood. And the Bible says, and when he had also smitten the waters, they parted thither and hither and thither, and Elisha went over. Now listen, and what the sons of the prophets were observing this. They saw him, and yeah, your master is going. But the Bible is clear. When these things part, another vision now hits the sons of the prophets. They also wake up to a sudden stupor. And the Bible says, and the sons of the prophets, the Bible says, 
which were to view at Jericho saw him, the Bible says they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him. What happened? They bowed themselves to him. Yet originally, God is taking your master. Elijah is Elijah's master. We are our own men of God. That's what they're saying. We are our own men of God. Hey, hey, do you know your Lord is taking your master? Are they expecting to say, oh, is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been taken up to a whirlwind. Quickly. Go, 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 follow him. Probably you'll win something. And so I see that when Elijah and Elisha cross and these guys stay back to observe, they're simply observing what's going to happen with the master and his son. What's going to really happen? Now, I am sure that when the water sparked again, a certain vision was hit them to realize, actually, the guy who has carried this mantle is not just another prophet who has received inheritance from his spiritual father. You're also sons of prophets. That's what the Bible calls you. That means probably also you received impartations either from your biological fathers which were prophets or you serve prophets and they also release something on your life. So you probably also think he's also in the class, probably have seen the culture and tradition thereof where you're a son of the prophet, you serve a prophet, he lays hands on you and then consequently you also start serving in the spirit realm, walking in a certain realm, right? Now they think, they're looking at Elijah and Elijah, they think it's business as usual. God is going to take him up, but they're going to lay hands on him and consequently he's also going to carry what his father carried. Like we sons of the prophets also carried when our, our fathers, which were prophets, laid hands on us. But when the anointing settles on Elijah, God gives them a vision of understanding to realize that the man that received this oil did not receive simple oil. He did not receive the usual oil. He received something that is both the chariot and the horseman of Israel. He is the army of the nation. When you have him, you don't need an army. He was given responsibility to keep Israel. As long as Elijah was alive, Israel was safe. Now he has put this responsibility to Elijah to tell him, look, this is more than you prophesying in Israel. The thing I'm putting on you is going to keep a whole nation. It shall be guarded by the word of your voice. That's what Elijah receives. That is why later you see, when the Assyrians are attacking Israel, he's in the realm that is allowed to access that because it's his responsibility to watch over Israel. And then there's a funny, among the 6,099, who think that by prayer and fasting, they'll also see attacks on Israel because he's a prophet. No. You stay in your individual small things, but when it comes to nation, the responsibility of a nation is given to certain people. Power the Did you understand? Now, somebody can say, oh me, me I don't believe it. Me I don't think that somebody can be denied access. Listen, access can be denied according to your level of understanding, assignment and responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom little is given, little is required. So when he tells him before you are formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I called you to be a prophet among nations or to nations. There's a difference. There's a difference between being a prophet in a nation and being a prophet unto a nation. Do you understand what I said? There's a difference between being a prophet in a nation and being a prophet unto a nation. That's deeper responsibility. And not everybody can handle that grace. Not everybody can handle that grace. Because it is too much power. It requires a certain state of heart to receive both the responsibility and maintain a certain humility. There are people, if they only had a half of this congregation, they would not be reachable. God is helping us by keeping them small. Because it's the only way we can see them on the road. Immediately they got, they said, we have 50 prophets here. Can we send them to look for your master? If perhaps he's disappeared and we can find him somewhere. Why? Because at that particular point, 
every prophet wants to come in contact with Elijah. That's why they say, can we send 50 men, strong men, to be pray that they may seek your master. Why? Because now they think if they can get to him, they will receive what's upon him. But he has gone to an Elijah. Somebody shout hallelujah. And where was that? When they see the experience at the bank of Jordan. Remember where we came from? From Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. Now, Elisha carries double grace of the spirit that was functioning in Elijah. Not anointing, but the spirit. Not anointing, but the spirit. Yes, he did double miracles, but that does not mean that his anointing was limited on those doubles. No, the responsibility on Elisha doubled. Now, there's a third guy called Gehazi. He too comes to serve oil. But I'm imagining if God gets what's upon Elijah and Elisha and puts it on one man. The scriptures tell us that Gehazi was given in two lucre money. He did not understand the order of falling after the anointing. There were certain principles that were not embedded in his spirit. That this man can heal an Assyrian, right? And he refuses to receive of him. Because the Assyrian spirit is one, I believe, of the most frustrating spirit to the order of men who have tested a certain grace in the anointing. The kingly prophet. That is why... <laughs> After David defeated the Assyrians, the Bible says he was tempted to stay back when kings go for war. That is the only reason why David saw Bathsheba. But if you read the scripture, you realize he stayed back when kings go for war. But what was the comfort? Because he felt relief after defeating the Assyrian. And then he felt in his heart, no, I think now I can stay back. You see, there's something again about the Assyrian spirit. You, if you're a student of the word and you go and study the Assyrian, you will understand that that's a very deadly spirit to deal with. He has refused to receive from this Assyrian, Naaman. He refused. He didn't need him. But Gehazi goes after the same one. Stuff. And he says, no, 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 my master sent it of me. What do they do? They give it to what? To him. And what happens? The scripture says Gehazi immediately is what? Carries the same thing that was on Naaman. And then he takes it over. The prophet asks him, now, were you so funny not to understand that I was there with you? That my spirit was there with you? In other words, Gehazi, you're serving me. And you think that the Levamat could not see you receive from the Assyrian. No, those are in my scope of right. Of course Gehazi saw that that was not in the scope of the prophet's right. But those were in the scope of the prophet's right. Why? Because we are dealing with an Assyrian here. And we are dealing with a certain order of the spirit. Father, son, something is coming upon you and we must guard you a certain way. You must keep a certain heart and character. What your father does not eat, don't eat. You don't even need to question why. Just don't. Just don't. If you see he's avoiding something, don't even ask why. You also avoid it. You'll understand later. Oh, me, if God tells me. Listen. <laughs> when your man of God stays away from something and you trust God speaks to him, stay away from it before you understand it. You can ask questions later, but stay away from it. That is why if you want to understand this responsibility, when Elisha is about to die, in 2 Kings 13, verses 14. Elisha falls sick, and his sickness is going to lead to death, for 2 Kings 13, uh, verses 14. And Joash, the king of Israel, comes down unto him, and wept over his face, and say, what does the word he say? He says again, Oh, my father. Again, he repeats the same word. Uh-huh. The chariot of Israel, and then the horsemen thereof. He repeats the exact word. The scriptures tell us, 
and El when he when he said, "Oh my father, the horseman and the chariot thereof," that was not just a sentence. It was a revelation that hit Joash the king. Boom! When he's crying like this, God gives him a vision. He says, yes, this guy is going to die, but he is the chariot and the horseman of Israel. Joash just doesn't say it because everyone called Elisha so. In fact, scripture is clear. Nobody ever called Elisha so until this moment. When Joash again comes in contact, gets a vision, but what you don't see is that there was a vision cast on his spirit to understand that this is not just a prophet to Israel, but he is the horseman and chariot thereof of Israel. When he says it, and Elisha realizes that this guy has gotten the revelation, he tells him, take a bow. Immediately. The moment he mentions it, he tells him, take a bow and arrows. And he took and threw him the bows and arrows. And the Bible says, and Elisha, and he said to the king of Israel, put your hand upon the bow. And he puts his hand upon the bow. And Elisha put his hand upon the king's hands. So he's standing here as a sick man, but he's holding the king's hand like this. And then he tells him in the next verse, shoot. He says, open the window eastward. And he opened it and Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. The arrow of the deliverance from the what? The Assyrian again is here. Because he realizes this is the thing that killed Gehazi. It's a thing that has brought many men mighty down. Let's deal first with the defeat of the spirit. Because yes, I know that you're in line with this thing, but can we deal with the spirit? And then <laughs> smites it, the Assyrians in Africa, till thou hast consumed them. And the Bible says in the next verse, and he said, take the arrows. And he took them and he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the Bible says, and the man of God was wroth with him and said, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times, then thou should have had smite in Syria till it had consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria, but thrice. He said, you'll only have victory over Syria three times. Meaning, your victory over Syria will never be complete. At a particular point, it will overtake you again. You're not the candidate. You should have. Oh, how was I supposed to know? Because that's not the part of Elisha to tell you. If you followed after, you would have striken five or six times, if you followed after. Now, that was a test of an incomplete man, yet with the right heart and vision. We've lost Gehazi already. The next servant who serves Elisha is nameless. God never gave him even the identity and honor of having a name. The rest of the stuff after Gehazi, we hear the servant of Elijah. The servant of Elijah. Oh, master, they have encompassed us. The Syrians want to kill us. Oh, again the Syrians. Open the eyes of him that he might see how many are can't say. But the Bible calls him the servant of Elijah. It refused to give him a name. Up to today, he never got an identity. And God realizes he lost that order. He lost that order. Thousands of years later, he says, let me repeat the order. In Luke chapter 1, verses 15, a man called John is born. He's going to be born in the world. He's going to come in, into the world. And the Bible says in the 15th verse, that for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him, in the spirit, again, and the power of Elijah to turn, listen, the hearts of the fathers to children and to the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just. Wisdom of the just, underline it. Because if you understand that, just the wisdom of the just, you'll know why Revelation is open to some people and it is close to certain people. Yet they live in the dispensation of the New Testament where all things are naked and defenseless. So, and to make ready a people prepared of the Lord. So you see, this guy is coming to reconcile the spirits, the hearts of fathers to sons, because then it was the fathering spirit, Elijah, passes inheritance to Elisha. Elisha is supposed to pass inheritance to whoever, either Gehazi or Josh, but they are incomplete, they have bread. They are bread not turned. They are not complete. They they don't understand the way. They've not even solved a certain way. So he says, okay, let me repeat the order. He gets John the Baptist and he brings him in the order. The same order of Elijah. And he says, no, let me send the spirit. Israel's 
always knew. It always suspected Elijah was going to come. That is why when Jesus begins with his disciples and says, Who do you think? Who do men say I am? He says, Some say you're Elijah. Because they always suspected Elias was coming. They just didn't know which age, which dispensation, and I was going to come. They always knew there was going to come a spirit to reconcile that order, but they never could tell when. Now, the scriptures tell us, when John comes in that spirit, he is the voice crying out in the wilderness, repenting for the kingdom of God is coming. There is a realm coming. There is a restoration of a certain order. In fact, scripture, Jesus says, Elijah must come and restore all things. Because Elijah is looked at as a restoring spirit of a certain order. No one in Luke chapter 3 verses 21, when all the people are baptized, it comes to pass that Jesus also comes to John, which comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He is the man qualified enough to baptize the Christ. He dips him into the water, praying the heaven is open. And the next verse 22 says, And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And the voice came from heaven, the one of the Father, which says, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Immediately, chapter 3, the moment God owns Jesus as Son, chapter 4, he's led into the wilderness. But where was Jesus baptized? Did you get it? The story ends at Jordan. When the water is parted, truly the spirit of Elijah rests upon him. But the message and the order is incomplete. So God wraps everything and again he begins from Jordan. And he says there is something we left here. That is why the chapter 4 of Luke says, And Jesus departed from, he says, He being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness experience has a precedent. And it's only for men which have been baptized in Jordan. not for everybody and the wildness is where the Lord kills you talks to you teaches you and you start to hear the voice of instruction but also he tries you into maturity three things happen that's why many Christians have run very quickly to the altar and they've come back limping why because they didn't follow the order some carry the conviction yes father father chariot and horseman they are of Israel but do you respect the process? If Christ honored that order, what about you? So if Elijah, that is why later he says in Matthew 17, 11, he says, he replied, Elijah does come, right? And will get everything restored and ready. He will restore all things. And the next verse, in verses 12, he says, but I tell you, Elijah is come already. He came through John. The Spirit came through John. But they knew him not and have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. In other words, what disturbed Elijah will disturb Elisha because they did not understand exactly when Elijah came. But Jesus tells them, look, the restorer of that order came through the Spirit and power of Elijah through John. But they didn't get it. And they killed him and dealt with him wickedly. Now that means I, Christ, this time I am coming in the spirit and power of Elisha. I'm not Elisha. No. But I needed a man to go before me. Because if I go before that man, I'm not sure whether he will complete it. So we switch places and I put a man before to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. But when I come in the mind and order of Elijah, I am sure to bring many sons to glory. Oh, glory! So what God is trying to tell you and I, that through Christ, he knew sin was an issue. He became the propitiation of your sins. He knew you needed an anointing. He said, my glory have I given them. He did stuff. Paul later says, everything that is known of God has been revealed unto them. Even the Godhead. He says that now men are without excuse. 
We are the third generation of that order in the spirit. That we are the completed total sum of the completion of what Elijah could not pass on to that generation because of its indifference. And now God calls this church to tell you, Christ has availed everything not to make you indifferent. In other words, you don't have excuse not to live in the threefold anointing. Again, it's the wisdom of this man that he will live on his inheritance for his children and his children's children. If as Elijah, I can effect Elisa and Gehazi, I am wise. But it's probably something that was missing in the original order. Maybe the stuff Elijah never taught Elisha. Did you understand what I just said? God restores the order in the New Testament. When he sees it, he says, These things I have done, you shall do. Comma. And greater works shall you do, because I go to my Father. How can we be powerless? I want you to raise your hands wherever you are and start to receive this because it's coming heavy. Start to speak in tongues wherever you are. Just start to speak. Come on, talk to God. Come on, just speak in tongues. Something is coming upon your life. If you have understanding of what I'm saying, you're going to start moving in an anointing. You're going to start moving in an anointing. The mystery revealed through love and sacrifice not of my own but of He came to me in peace and held me in His own. And say today, I found you. And say today, I found you. So it has been since then my when I received his mercy. Now love his feet is not where I am found, but on earth right by his side. But on the right side, oh, bro, son. Rabababa <laughs> Prata <laughs> 
robo rinda rebelego sarala la hosi ke prakata sobre prale le hosi re ke prala la my god my god my god this is what i hear the spirit of god say he says i'm anointing you i'm stirring something on your spirit a certain anointing is going to start to follow you you're going to walk in the authority i ordained for your life the fullness of my glory is going to be evident on you i entrust you with uganda i entrust you with africa i entrust you with the united states i entrust you with asia i entrust you with europe i entrust you with north america i entrust you with central america i entrust you with, with south america i entrust you i entrust you take it in the name of jesus there are people here your voices have been cloaked Your voice spirit has not registered in the spirit realm before. But as a man of God in this hour, I am speaking upon and anointing upon your life where your voice will not be ignored. Where your voice will give direction to the leaders of your nation. Where your voice will give order to the things that are living and are not living. Where your voice will be printed on the hardest things in this world. Receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. The prophet here. God is pouring something special. Anybody anointed in the prophetic, start to receive it. 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 Apostle, receive it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus, receive it. Rapa katana baba. Ekangeli. Pablo Orega. Oh, yale. What's up? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the responsibility? Come on it out. Receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. Pastor, receive it. Intercessors, receive it. Business people, receive it. Shouldn't receive it. Doctors, receive it. Engineers, receive it. I sense something. I sense something. I sense something. Rabakatalapa. I call out everything that was hidden in you. Everything that God has ordained for this nation, for the world, for the generation. Even those who are live streaming right now, the power of God comes in your room. It comes while you're live streaming. God is touching you. God is anointing you. You're going to change this world. They are anointing that just don't come to give you cars. They are anointing that just don't come to give you houses. They come to give you a generation. Right now I sense it my spirit. Oh God! Rapatala baye. Receive it. Receive it.
I'm telling you. I tested this years ago. I was a very normal man. Very normal man. But the day I tested this thing, the day I understood this thing, something happened. And it's happening to you right now. you're sick in your body, God is healing you now. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, you want to be born again, you say, I've heard the word apostle, and I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Repeat this words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I've heard your word and your testimony. The Bible says, with the heart, a man believes and confession is made to salvation. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make mountains.